But I do think that in, it's possible in principle that science could give an answer as to whether or not it would be conducive to human well-being to be more modest or to what extent we should be modest. So the, the, I've looked into this. I've spent years of research as well, so hopefully some of that can possibly benefit you. So your position is you're saying you're just just restate your position. Well, my position as to why I say I'm an atheist. Or just your position about the universe and. Well, I just I claim to be an atheist because I don't believe in God, and the reason I don't believe in God is just because I haven't been convinced. But atheism is like a solid claim, isn't it? Well, there's different definitions of atheism. There's what definition do you have? There's not one single definition of atheism, right? And some people believe that in order to be an atheist, you're making an active claim, which is probably what you believe. I disagree. I don't think I have to make an active claim. I think it's just sufficient to say, if I haven't been convinced for the reasons to believe in something, then I just say that I don't believe in it. Okay. And it's that simple, really. Okay. Uh, if somebody says to me a piece of information and I don't believe it, hmm? uh, is it okay if he clips that on you? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Just do it on the scarf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, when you look at the universe yourself, what's your explanation? My explanation, I don't think that I have a clear enough explanation. But what's, where universe. have you reached so far? I'm not going to hold you to anything, by yeah. the way. I'm not going to say, aha, I got you. I just want to know, what's your name? Anna East. Anna East? <laughs> yeah. Is it okay if I call you Anna? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, my name is Zishan. Okay, Zishan. You can call me Z or whatever, I don't mind. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so don't think that just because you've stated something, I, I want to speak to Anna East. Anna East, and I want to know your position, and uh, that that's why I want to kind of go back and forth. So, yeah, don't feel that you have to know about the whole thing, or you have to have a... Whatever stance you currently hold, we can explore that. Yeah. And you can change that stance tomorrow, or whatever, yeah. that's life. Yeah. So what's your explanation when you sit down and you look up and you look at the, the sky, you look at the clouds, you look at the animals, you look at the creatures, What's your explanation to how it kind of came into existence? I mean, I think instinctively we all come up with our own explanations for things, right? Whether an idea comes to us or whether somebody told us something that's really convincing and, you know, it happens to me too, but I really do try my hardest and I fail at it, but I try my hardest to base my beliefs on any objective evidence that I can get. And usually that means that I base my beliefs in science. And I think that is why I struggle so much with being convinced to believe in God because I'm not sure that science could provide an explanation for that. And you know, it would require a leap of faith. And I'm just I'm just not convinced. Just hold this for now, please. So in terms of my beliefs about the universe, the beliefs that I do have about how we're here and how the universe was created is based on however much I've been able to read on what science can provide as an explanation as to the causes of the universe. So that's where I base my beliefs on is science. Okay. As so, much as I can, of course, because we don't have all the time in the world to read. No, 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 that, that makes sense. And to be honest, that's a position, uh, it, it's not that uncommon. Because even from a young age, when we go to school, uh, even when it comes to the inventions that we see, science is held up, um, you know, as a great contributor to what we see today, of course. But as, uh, I'm not sure if you acknowledge this, you've acknowledged, isn't it, that science doesn't claim to have answers of the metaphysical and why questions. I don't think that they, science has been able to provide that answers for me. Yeah. I don't know if science is, I don't speak for science. <laughs> yeah. So there, there are, I mean, um, Einstein made this uh, point as well, that science doesn't claim to talk about morals. It, it can't. You can't provide scientific evidence for a certain moral. You can't. I disagree. Yeah. How, how would you kind of evidence if um, something is good or bad using yeah, science? So I, I take a lot of my beliefs on morality based on Sam Harris's book, 
on morality. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. Sam Harris. Yeah, so he believes that we can determine objective values based off of science and that science can help us make moral claims. And so the reason for that is science can tell us whether or not a behavior is conducive to human well-being. And if it is conducive to human well-being, then we would say it's moral. If it's not, then we would say it's immoral. Now, of course, we science still can't provide all of the answers, but that's not to say that they can't provide the answers in principle. And also, you'd have to believe that, you know, morality is based on human well-being. I personally do believe that that's what morality is. So that's how I get my morality. So your morality is the pleasure and pain principle, yeah, the harm principle. Because that's in essence the summary of what he posits to be something that's moral. If something gives you pleasure, that's good. If the pleasure outweighs pain, that's good. If pain outweighs pleasure, it's bad. But not just on an individual level. Also, we're taking into account everybody's human being. So it's not just mine. And also when we talk about pleasure and pain, we're also talking about long-term pleasure and long-term, right? Yeah. So it's not that just because something brings you short-term pleasure that that's conducive to human well-being. The only problem with that is, of course, different societies are exposed to different stimuli and their collectives are going to be based upon their current understanding. For example, if you go to the Amazon rainforest, their morality is going to be different to, say, somebody else's morality. So, again, it comes back to this point. And I don't think even Sam Harris has made this claim that you have objective morality within our, you know, that we can evidence objective morality from science. Because like you said, something longitudinal, um, longitudinally ut utilitarianism, you're aware of utilitarianism, yeah, yeah. yeah. So longitudinal utilitarianism is something, again, is subjective on certain communities. Certain communities will have a big issue with, uh, say, covering certain parts of the body. Yeah. Certain communities won't have an issue with that whatsoever. Yeah. And these are two moral stances. But, but I do think that in, it's possible in principle that science could give an answer as to whether or not it would be conducive to human well-being to be more modest or to what extent we should be modest. Like I do think in principle that answer science could give us. Whether or not we have that answer today, we don't, you know? But I do think it exists. And I do think as, as science progresses, what we will be able to say is moral or immoral will be increasingly constrained. So as an example, um, hitting your child, so using corporal punishment, science has there's overwhelming scientific research to show that that is something that is not conducive to human well-being because it makes children more aggressive. And so then we could say if there's an overwhelming amount of scientific research to show that a certain type of behavior is going to cause more long-term suffering, then it, it's hard to then say that that is moral. The thing is science bases its model primarily on induction. And induction, again, is a very yeah. limited process, it's observations, and those right. observations continuously change. Yeah. Yes, indeed, that, that uh, research might be there, but the research to suggest even uh, when we started speaking uh, as a species, yeah. there was like a standard kind of agreement just a couple of days ago. There's a research that's come out saying, no, it's actually seven times further back. Right. So it's constantly going to change. And that, that's why I say when it comes to objective morality, science itself is a model based upon so, so this, she's uh, she's preaching christianity i know it's very is, interesting I, yes. i'm not sure if jesus would approve of that. I, I i agree i agree if he said uh, give the other cheek i don't think that's exactly indicative of that so yeah because science is something that's um, induction be he married a nine because year old child science is based upon induction, induction child. is based upon be your careful. observations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So, so based upon morality is something, would you say that morality is Wait, constantly... Wait, sorry, can I just touch back yeah. on your point about how new scientific evidence came out disproving previous yes. scientific evidence? And I think 
that that's an important point and the morality it, changes as well according to you but i don't think necessarily that means morality changes because what i would say is that that is just evidence like there's a difference between answers in practice and answers in principle so just because science is pointing to a certain answer right now doesn't necessarily mean that it's the correct answer like you're right we might do further you know research and discover that actually what we thought was wrong but it's not that there wasn't an answer in principle it's just that we hadn't done enough research to get to the right answer there's, there's also one thing i also want to draw your attention towards as well because you're correlating harm with wrong because you're saying if harm is being brought to so and so that implies that it's wrong well not necessarily and that's why i don't use the word harm i use well-being because i do think a certain amount of harm is necessary and good to well-being like exactly. suffering is a necessary part of human existence and i don't think all suffering is bad if that makes sense but what i'm saying is when it comes to science science will base things upon harm it will based upon certain synapses firing it will be based upon uh, the temperature increasing it will be based again on yeah. the material and on the physical yeah. science can and it hasn't ever and it won't because it's not in the scope of science to say this is good this is bad it can say this can cause harm and this will be conducive in terms of more hormones being produced or more endorphins being released as it does with exercise but it won't say that this is good this is bad you see it's not a claim science makes and that's why even in certain debates as well this uh, th th this is not a claim that atheists necessarily defend you're welcome to defend it but to say that if i do an experiment let, let me give you one simple example if for example i bit a, a, a baked cake was on my table and i had to use science to determine why it was made yeah i can kind of look at the chemical con uh, construction of it and all that sort of stuff however it would never be able to tell me why it was made or if it was made for a good reason that can only be that's a moral stance that's a metaphysical stance that can only be given by my aunt who can come and say i baked that for you this was my intention but if i'm just to use science just to use right. yeah and i agree with you there Fantastic. so i don't think science can tell you whether something is good or something is bad but i think science can tell you whether or not something is conducive to well-being yeah, yeah yeah and then if you believe which is my personal belief that human well-being should be kind of the measure for whether or not something is moral or immoral mm. then you can use science as a tool for morality but it's not that i'm saying that sorry should, should we just move over here is that yeah, okay yeah. Yeah, yeah it's not that i'm saying that science on its own says good or bad yeah it's that science can provide us answers as to whether or not like I science said. science it definitely contributes to the discussion 100 i agree with you like science can definitely tell us um if this thing is helpful and beneficial like you're alluding to uh, this individual however to say this is good this is bad the science doesn't necessarily claim that of course it's yeah. it's helpful to the conversation right um but to say that it has moral stances yeah it doesn't no and i yeah. agree i don't think science has moral stances what i'm saying is that okay, science okay. can be used as a tool to feed off our mama the lie about sense. jesus christ Jesus Christ sense? is the way, so the like, truth, and the life. I believe Jesus that what is moral and immoral is whether something is, like I said, conducive to well-being or whether it's Jesus not. Is the way, the and truth, science is used as a tool to determine. Science, science is de definitely is helpful. It's definitely helpful. But if, for example, you know the example of the Roman Colosseum, where you'd have a Christian there, and that that's so annoying. <laughs> so. Um, Yeah, that's why we have to repeat stuff again and again. So, yeah, so the Roman Colosseum, sorry. You had a Christian there who would be harmed for the benefit of the whole crowd. So, if you balance pleasure over pain, the pain of one individual over the pleasure of, you know, numerous people, that society would say, you know what, that's good. And according to science, they can use science. I mean, eugenics has been used as well, but, but eugenics was used incorrectly. Exactly. Do you see? But science was still used. No, but, but the science was wrong. That's my point. Is the science was wrong? Like people were using fake research. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So you'll have data. 
that data now are using Bayesian probability, are using um, regression, are using um, freedom to exclude uh, outliers, etc. There's certain models that you can use to interpret certain data. And different people might come to different conclusions, as we know, as we know from the Amgen study and uh, where, where the, they were looked at and different, um, even though they were peer reviewed, when the data was looked at, certain experts came to different kind of conclusions. So again, science provides the raw data and then it relies on certain individuals how they're going to interpret that data because again i'm sure you'd agree science depends on human interpretation it, but do you think yeah. so for example with the data do you think that in principle not is there somebody out there who can correctly interpret the data but do you think in principle out there there is a correct way to interpret that data i think that correct way there's to, to say that there's a correct way would mean that that human has no biases has so unlimited not, not even, funding. Not even yeah. can a human do it. Just in principle, is there a correct interpretation of Ob data? Objectively, uh, when you're using science, are you talking about science based upon induction? Or are you talking about science if we had all of the data in the world, would, what would we? Because I believe if you had all of the data, then you naturally come to an informed position. However, right. when you base it upon your limited observations, yes. as had yes. happened at the time of Isaac Newton, and right. then he was abrogated by Einstein based upon more observations that came in. Right. And he was again is somewhat being abrogated by quantum mechanics yes, yes, because yes. we're having more and more observations, yeah. do you see? Yeah, so I, I think we both agree though there is an answer in principle. Like you said, you know, if we were able to compute in all of un, the data. Unrealistic the, principle, yeah, yeah. yeah if we I had mean, all of like, the I'm not even claiming that we yeah. can get there. That it's even possible to know. But I'm saying in principle that answer exists. Fantastic. I'm not saying we will ever be capable of getting to that answer, but I think like that answer does exist. And for me, I think we can get closer to that answer by using science. And for me, that is the So science is, is a tool. tool. I, I agree yeah. with you. Science yeah. is, is a tool that even we utilize as well. But to claim that science will give a conclusion um, that is objectively measurable, that's where I think we're on shaky I think, ground here. I, I think Science can provide a conclusion, an objectively correct conclusion in principle. Whether or not we can do that in practice, I don't know. But I think in principle it can. Because there is an answer out there. Has I'm it, not has, saying I will get yeah. the answer. I'm not saying we will has, ever get has the it answer. Given, has it given an objectively measurable thing when it comes to morality in your opinion? In my opinion, I think that science has been able to give me a lot of answers as to things. What well, one thing can we look at yeah. uh, that you can say that's something that... Well, the example I gave you earlier, like using corporal punishment. But back in the days, there were also studies to suggest how beneficial that is. And certain people, there have been yeah. counter studies to that as well, yeah. to suggest how people that have gone through that Again, I'm not advocating for that because it's against the law here. Yeah. Um, but somebody that is going through that, there will be certain people saying, you know what, we've grown up with that and we're, we're happier if we didn't receive that, that would be an issue. And there, there is scientific research to back that as well. Do you see? So to, to say that there's something that objectively would be accepted again, but let's put this on ice for now. We can come back but to I this would again. also say, yeah. like, for example, there are conspiracy theorists that come up with their own evidence as to why the Earth is flat, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, yeah, I guess they're using their own version of science, but it doesn't mean that it's correct. And there are better answers and better research. And for me, I just try my hardest to find out whatever is the most credible and most objective evidence. And obviously that's really difficult to do. It is, especially and when it comes to certain scientists sure. getting funding for and sure. the peer reviewed process. And yeah. there's a, a lot of these things that can inherently be contaminated. 100%. And then affecting us as well, because we would technically take the things that will confirmation bias, etc. Yeah. So this is a fantastic conversation. We can continue this, but uh, like the brother started, I don't know where he's gone now. Um, what, what, what he started with you was, do, do you accept that you exist and that I exist? Yeah. Okay. And then he said that there are three types of existences. Yeah, he told yeah? me about that. Yeah, the contingent existence, a necessary existence and an impossible existence. 
So this is in modal logic, it's something accepted by Leibniz, Aristotle, etc, etc. Base, base, do you accept that premise? That there are three types of existence, or do you um, think there's another type of existence? I, don't, I, I wasn't, I'm not sure that I understood it fully. Okay, so. no problem. Then, if I say it, just stop me in the middle. Don't be polite and just nod along and not understand it. You're more than welcome to just stop me and say, what did you mean by this or that? And I'll try my best to explain to you, okay. if I can. So, existence, because however skeptical you may be, the skeptic typically says, how do we know? Yeah, how do we know anything? Yeah, so... Descartes, he says that, okay, at the very least, I think, therefore, I am. Yeah, that was his kind of conclusion as to, yeah, as to why he exists. Yeah, the fact that he th he's yeah. thinking that necessitates that he exists. He's alive. So, in philosophy and in modal logic as well, there's three types of, uh, there's three types of existence. You have contingent existence, which is a, a fancy way of saying something that depends on something else. There's certain criteria for that as well which we can unpack later if you want. But for now, I don't want to inundate you with too much. If you, if you ask for it, I can unpack it for you if you want. So something that's dependent, something which is independent, also called necessary, or something which is impossible. Yeah, like the law of non-contradiction, like a squared circle. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So as human beings, would you say that we are dependent or independent? Just dependent on things around you, like human beings were dependent on air, were dependent on water, were dependent on sunlight, dependent on food and on sustenance. Yeah. So we're dependent. So we dependent on something else. That depends on something else, and it continues. Now philosophically, there's two options here. Either there is an end to that chain, or there's an infinite regress. You understand infinite yeah. regress? Yeah. So those are the two options. Which of those two options do you think makes the most rational sense? Well... Or is there another option? I mean, I'm not sure because even with infinity, I mean, the concept of infinity we're, isn't we're that talking infinite regress. Not, a, not a mathematical infinity. We're talking about a practical infinity. And even when we're talking about infinity, the reason why infinite regress can't take place, let's just say if I'm about to throw something, yeah, and I have to ask someone's permission, they have to ask someone's permission, they have to ask some, someone's permission. If it goes on for infinity, I'm not going to be able to throw that ball, am I? Yeah. Because I have, there's no confirmation. So the mere fact that we exist means that there was an end to that chain, which in philosophy is called the necessary existence. Yeah, an end to that causal chain or contingent chain. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, d you had an issue with the infinite thing. I don't want to go forward if you're a bit unsure of that. Should we unpack that a little bit? That's okay. No, you can continue. Okay, no problem. So, what we would say is philosophically, logically, rationally, you can't have an infinite regress of dependent things. So, for us to exist, the mere fact that we exist, there has to have been an end to that chain, which we say is a necessary existence. Now, for us, does this argument make sense for you at the moment, logically? Yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. So then we take it a step further, we say this necessary existence has to have been independent because it's the end to that chain. It's the end to that chain. Okay. Independency? It has to be pre and post eternal. Reason being, because everything depends on it, if that thing ceased to exist, then we would cease to exist and everything would be destroyed. Yeah, so the mere fact that we have a continuation, we're here, we have a continuation in our experience, that means we're not being destroyed, that means the necessary existence is still there. Yeah, it's not coming in and out of existence. Okay. Yeah, so pre and post eternal. I would also argue that it has a will. Reason being, because we were created in a particular moment. So when something is created in a particular moment, that means that a choice is being made. For example, a painter that's sitting in front of a canvas and he decides, huh, that huh, means that that person has an idea in mind, a choice is being made that they are painting something. Make sense? You're more than welcome to jump in. I don't want it to just be a monologue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we said independent. Um, one, 
because it's the end of the causal chain. Doesn't beget noise, a begotten, like it, because it's the beginning, naturally it doesn't have uh, something that it depends upon. And there's nothing like it naturally because everything else is contingent. That thing is necessary, i.e. anything that you see around you is dependent. It depends on something that doesn't depend. Now, as a Muslim, that's our definition of a God. Yeah. Yeah. We don't believe God is a tree. We don't believe God is a human being. We don't believe God is us, like we're not God. So logically and rationally to you, Anna, is this something that is conceivable logically to you? I think where I struggle is making the jump from a first cause that then equates to how you conceptualize God. But that's just what I said in terms of will, which you didn't have any uh, issue with well, independence. Well, will, I mean, I would say, I mean, here we're going to disagree, I think, fundamentally, of because I assume you don't believe in evolution. I, I don't believe evolution contradicts religion. Okay. Because evolution... Uh, we, uh, evolution is a working model that we have. Dawkins has accepted this in the Devil's Chaplain as well. Yeah. He says yeah. that if tomorrow we have different observations, we have every reason to change it. Yeah. We have no issues with that. Yeah. But we have an issue, Anna, when people come and say this is the model, it's written in stone, yeah. and you must believe this. Right, right. That's the issue that we have. Okay, and I just, understand that. I yeah. think for me with the will thing, like... Just so I can just finish this yeah, point. Yeah, of course. When it comes to evolution, Big Bang, we say these are mechanisms. And God is a creator of mechanisms. Okay. So they, we believe there's a, there's a category mistake when people are asking us to choose one or the other. Right. We believe just because you know how something works doesn't exclude the creator. For example, a Ford car was created by Henry Ford. Just because I know how a car works, oh, these are the pistons, this is the engine, this is where the oil goes in. Oh, I know how it works, therefore there's no creator. I think that's fallacious reasoning. I'm saying just because I know how it works, Henry Ford still created it, but I know how it works. Like that, that gives me more knowledge, but it doesn't exclude the creator. Right, okay. How does that sound? I mean, I understand what you're saying. I think for me, I, I, I don't necessarily believe that, even if I were to say, okay, I agree with you that there was a first cause. Let's say I were to say that. I don't then necessarily believe that it follows that then this first cause that then created the second cause also had an intention for the 500th cause. Let's say like we're the 500th cause, right? I don't I don't think that necessarily follows. And so because I do believe in evolution, I believe that the fact that humans exist... Should we move? Oh, the Kareem. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. Chance, and it's due to the fact that different things in the universe interacted in a certain way that then allowed for human existence to be created. So, like evolution. So do you I don't believe that this first cause or first creator, as you want to call it, willed for us to be here. So even if I were to accept that I could believe in first cause or first creator, I don't think that it necessarily follows that this first cause or creator willed for us to be here. Do you believe we've we come by chance? In. Let me step in, please. I want to step in. You know what she said? I can prove all of that. I can prove all of that. Look. Do you, do you agree there's a Big Bang? Yes. Do you agree there's a Big Bang, the start of the universe? Well, the universe as we know it, yeah. As a beginning, right? Yeah. So it's the Big Bang, isn't it? The sec second... Brother, let, let's just finish this conversation oh. first because we've been building it up, isn't it? And then you can but jump in later. No, I'm saying the conversation has to finish. I can finish it right now. Not necessarily. I can though, you, brother, But man. you can have another conversation. If you want to finish that one, you can finish that one. But this one, we want to keep it going. Yeah. Okay, so do you believe that we come by chance? As a simplistic, however. Yeah. yeah. So chance itself is something which is arbitrary and it's something that's non-material. There's a, there's a fallacy called the fallacy of reification, yeah? which is 
taking something immaterial and giving it material properties. Okay. Yeah? So chance itself is not a creating force. Chance is an explanation of things. For example, you would never say the roll of a dice created such and such thing. Right, right, For example, right. the rolling of the dice then caused the dice to roll. Right. Do you see? Or, in other words, laws and uh, chance, these things don't create things. These require something to do it and then people add chance, etc, etc to it. For example, gravity or the law of motion. Somebody that's, you know, the ball moving. The law of motion didn't cause the ball to move. Gravity. Gravity itself didn't cause the lamppost to fall. Yeah, these are all explanations of how it fell. But the agency element is still there. Make sense? Yes! Do you want me to unpack it a bit more? Yeah. Okay, so when, for example, people say chance, how did this happen? Oh, it happened by chance. Chance itself is not a material thing. It doesn't do anything. It's an explanation. It's not a doing, it's not a verb. Yeah, to put it simplistically. So when, for example, you say, oh, X baked the cake. Okay, but exothermic reaction is the explanation of how that cake formed in the oven, but it doesn't explain who baked the cake. So it's the same with chance. People saying, oh, chance did it. Chance is unconscious, unguided force. And to say that, look, things came together and we have Anna, we have symmetry, we have objective ways of measuring beauty in our creation. To associate that to chance, I would be forced to ask what other chance can create something with a great deal of information. No dictionary, if you see a dictionary, if you see a great deal of information code, no one would say, oh, chance. You would immediately associate a great deal of information with the creator of that. So similarly, what I'm saying is that with the universe, we see a great deal of not only data, we see a great deal of design. Yeah, and the design can be measured objectively. For example, have you heard of the golden ratio? Yeah. Fibonacci spiral, Fibonacci's ratio, symmetry, say butterflies and you know, you see all of these things. These are objective beauty standards that we can see. And to say that, no, it's chance, chance created it. No, chance is an explanation or sometimes it's, it's a way out people have. Chance is not a physical creating entity. The, the question of a physical creative entity still stands. Yeah? Okay, so coming back to this point, I, I would also say the necessary existence has an immeasurable amount of power. I'll come back, I haven't forgotten your point by the way, I'm not sidestepping that. It has an immeasurable amount of power. And stay with me here. We get power from that which we depend upon. Yeah, so for example, a toy, it will get its energy from batteries. It depends on those batteries. And that battery has to have enough energy to keep the toy going. And that battery gets its energy from something else, that gets its energy from something else, etc, etc. So we get our, our energy from that which we depend upon. Yeah, so if there's an infinite regress of power, naturally, if everything depends, everything of power, depends on one source, the necessary existence, it, uh, it follows that that thing is also immeasurably powerful. Let me, can I, can I say something please? Why not? I understand what you you're like saying. You like that point. No, I, was, I don't know if I agree, but I, I get what you're saying. But you like that point though. <laughs> so, can I, can oh, I, later inshallah, yeah? Because we've been uh, speaking for a while, no, we've got disturbed. Five, five minutes. You can, you can speak five later, minutes. brother. But this is going to interrupt our flow inshallah, yeah? Five minutes, I'll come. Oh, please, please. Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> but don't you think a cause... Don't, don't. Okay, don't I want to. I, okay, let's yeah. just say creator. Can you use like? No, no, no. You, you can use any term you want. Create something that, that can then create something else that no longer depends on me. No. You don't think so? No. So I don't know if I agree. You do. You do. You do. Can I tell you why? Look, because when you when you depend on when you depend on something, that depends on something else. By definition, either you're contingent or you're necessary. What you're saying is, can something dependent? 
give rise to something That's independent. Correct. Philosophically, that is. No, I think I'm saying that it, it might no longer be dependent on me. Like, it's so far removed. But that's what I'm saying. Something that is contingent, philosophically fulfills three criteria. Contingent is something composed of parts. If you're composed of parts, then you're contingent because you are dependent upon that part. If this arm, God forbid, gets removed, I'm dependent on this, I can't function properly. I can't clap. Yeah, because I only have one arm. Yeah, so similarly, I'm dependent on these parts. So if that thing that you've created either has parts, it can cease to exist, and it can be any other way, that's contingent. And by definition, it will be dependent. If that thing, you can give me an example of something that is contingent, that gives rise to something necessary, then maybe I can. Yeah. So now it'll be interesting to see if you can come up I'll with an example. Think about it. You think about it. Because Anna, I'm telling you, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. There is none. This is a, it's a solid argument. Yeah. And it's so simple, Anna. And that's why I want you to keep hitting me back. Because I'm telling you, you can't have an infinite regress of dependent things, contingent things, because all of these contingent things compose of parts, can cease to exist, can be any other way. Yeah, the tree is dependent upon its roots, dependent upon its bark, dependent upon oxygen, it's dependent on this. As human beings, we are as well. And then the end of the chain will power, independence, eternality, and also intelligence. Would you say that there's intelligence in the creation that you've seen? Yeah, when we look at objective symmetry, golden ratio, Anna, like, honestly, I thought it would take us less time because when we see beauty, we never, like, when you see a canvas, you never say, oh, wow, like, I've seen the weirdest art, and people go, wow, the art is amazing, and they'll appreciate it. But they would never say, oh yeah, yeah, that came by chance. You see the, a portrait of a human being, amazing, fantastic. Mona Lisa, amazing. Wow, I wish she would smile a bit more. Okay, but it's very amazing, she looks pretty. No one would ever say that's created by chance. But the human being, chance. Okay, has chance created anything else? Is chance a creator? Anna, we don't accept that for anything else. No, but it, it, it's not just... Let me give you an example, let me give you an example, let me give you an example. Let's just say you're at home and then a child, as soon as you enter the kitchen, the child is coming down the stairs with cookie stains on his mouth, with a cookie in his hand. And then you're like, did you take the cookies from the cookie jar? And he goes, nah, it was chance. You'd never accept that. What are you doing? You haven't seen him. You haven't done any ev evidence testing. You're using your inference to the best explanation that look, all the evidence is pointing towards him stealing from the cookie jar. When there's so much information, there's so much design, why is it, Anna, that we resort to such frivolities? But it's not that I would say it's chance, it's that I would say it, it was just the necessary causation. Necessary being, uh, necessary existence. Yeah, but it's not that I think it was like with the will, as you were saying. Okay. You know so, what I mean? I, like, I don't think it's like complete chance that humans are here because it was let me unpack the will all thing. based on previous causes, like the fact that the earth was a certain temperature and all of these things, like all of these other factors. So it's not that it's totally random. Let me un unpack the will thing a little bit. So I, I gave the example. After this, I'm going to have to leave you because no I just problem. left my friend. Uh, I just abandoned him. Oh, man. <laughs> Okay, now thank you for your time as well. Um, so let me know when you have to go. So yeah. when it comes to will, if for example, you have colors and you have shapes, let's just say you've got blocks and you have a block which is too blue, too white, too blue. Yeah, just like that. Sorry, I'm fasting, that's why. Thank you, thank you. So too blue, too white. Is that your friend, yeah? No, no. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, sorry, no, 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 no problem. No, it's because I just told them about my friend, but anyways. Yeah, she just yeah, what, what, what argument is it? So I think she has to go. That's why we thought you were the friend. That's why she has to go. So you got too blue, too white, too blue. That shows that a person or an individual has made a conscious choice of picking a blue block. Then a blue block, a white block, a white. When you have certain options, white, blue, red, and when blue and white is there, that means a will, that's, that's indicative of a will. A choice has been made 
Out of all of the colors, blue. Out of all of the colors, white. Out of all of the shapes, the square. Out of all of the shapes, another square. So this, again, is indicative of a will. A choice has been made that we are one way and not another way. That we could have been another way. That means a choice has been made with regards to us, with regards to what's around. So the inference to the best explanation is that it necessitates or it's logical to assume that there is a will and it wasn't done randomly, it wasn't done uh, for no reason or no purpose whatsoever. And if we then take this further and we say, look, it's logical to assume that there is intelligence because of the complexity, because of the precision that we're seeing, because of the design that we're seeing in terms of symmetry and stuff like that, I would say it's logical to assume that this necessary existence has intelligence as well. And it has wisdom. And it's unbefitting of wisdom to, to create things for no reason whatsoever. To just leave it just in the middle of space on a ball, just doing whatever, that's not indicative of an existence which is both intelligent, wise, powerful. That's the case, Anna, that, that I've presented today. I'm respectful of your time as well, that, you know, your, your friend is there as well. I would love to continue this, I know. but I don't Maybe want to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be here next week if you do want to come. Well, it was lovely speaking. Likewise, likewise, Anna. Take care, and I'll be here. Think about this. You have the book as well. I will. And, uh, I will. I'll be here. I'll look Thank into you. It. Nice Thank to you. meet you, Anna. Do I have to get, do I have the microphone? Yeah. What's up, you? What's up?